Right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to all of you who are joining us for what should prove to be a very interesting webinar on how we can achieve sustainability without compromising accessibility and inclusion. My name is Jim Morey, and myself and Anne Fry are co chairing this evening's discussion, which also includes three expert panellists whom I'll introduce to you in a few moments. Uh, firstly, I should explain that tonight's webinar is a joint event between the Transport Planning Society and the Access and Inclusion Forum of the Chartered Institution of Logistics and Transport. Uh, these two institutions, both for TPS and CILT, represent a wide range of professionals working in the highways, transport and transport planning sectors. Our members work in anything and everything to do with those sectors, it, from formulating local or national policies to designing cycle lanes to running buses, trains and ferries. We support our members by providing training and continuing professional development, including seminars and webinars such as these we're holding this evening. Uh, tonight's webinar is also part of a build up to this year's Transport Planning Day, which uh, focuses on equality, diversity and inclusion, EDI in uh, acronym speak. OK, um, let's say that focus on this has been sharpened by the pandemic, which has shone a light on profound inequalities in our communities. Now more than ever, the transport planning profession needs to help build and design a more inclusive society, one that accounts for the diverse needs of the people who use it. And I'd just like to say that tonight's IT admin support comes from Brogan and her colleagues at uh, CILT PTRC. Just housekeeping, I'll say that in a few minutes, I'll pass over to Anne and our panelists to introduce themselves. But, uh, but before then, I'll say that we'll be taking questions for the panel. Uh, please post any questions using the Zoom question and answer function. And what will happen is we'll, uh, we'll collate them and put them to the panel when we open the discussion up. Uh, the chat function has deliberately been turned off this evening. Uh, that's to help with accessibility and to reduce the uh, number of different things trying to go on at once. Uh, closed captioning is available. It's not 100% reliable speech to text, but we will try to speak as clearly as possible so that it works well. There won't be any uh, slides today, so no death by PowerPoint. You'll just have to listen to us. Uh, this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube at some point within the next few weeks, along with any useful links and transcripts. Uh, talking of which, if you do have any useful links, uh, please, please send them in either by the Q&A function or, or email any of us who are on the panel or or whichever other way would get to us. I mean, you can send me a message by LinkedIn or whatever, and uh, we can add it to the pack which goes out with the uh, with the recording of this. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to say a few words about myself before I uh, move on to the panel and the topic in hand today. Uh, my name's Jim Mori, as I said. I work as an access consultant, and I specialise in streets and transport. In my day job, I undertake access audits, design appraisals, and user engagements. Uh, my original background is in highways and transport for 30 odd years, and I've worked in public, private, and voluntary sectors, and I now work freelance. I am disabled myself, and I'm heavily involved with a number of disabled persons organizations, most of which are pan disability. So therefore, on top of the day job, I also do a lot of advocacy uh, with and alongside other disabled people. And also I've done a lot of voluntary care work in the past, as well as undertaking original research around transport access. And I should point out that when I use the term disabled, I'm using the Equality Act definition. And I'm also referring to the social model of disability, where a 
whereby a person is disabled by their environment, not necessarily by their own condition. I just thought I'd clear that up. And, uh, and my role in all this is I'm a co-opted member of a transport planning society with portfolio for accessibility. And along with Joe Ward and others on the uh, boards, we share responsibility for equality, diversity and inclusion matters. And Joe will talk about that later, I'm sure. I'm also on the Access and Inclusion Forum of the CILT, of which Anne is chair and uh, uh, co-producers of this evening. And I'm also a member of the Access Association, plus the Institute of Highway Engineers and CIHT as well. But tonight's topic uh, is sustainability versus inclusion, squaring the circle. It's a bit dramatic, but I'd like to say I've been as passionate about sustainability for as long as I've been passionate about accessibility and inclusion and universal design, perhaps even longer. In my view, they're both of critical importance to our future. And most crucially, I don't believe that they are mutually exclusive or contradictory aims to have. But it's in the execution of certain policies and schemes that are intended to improve sustainability and to promote active travel, which has led to this perceived dichotomy between the two and has led to some sort of uh, conflict. Let's be honest, no planner, engineer or transport operator wakes up in the morning with desire to deliberately make the built environment or transport less accessible. I mean, quite the opposite. Anybody who attended our previous TPS webinar on uh, equality impact assessments would have got, would, would have gotten an appreciation of how much effort goes into designing and implementing many schemes. But issues can easily happen if uh, things are rushed without giving due consideration and appropriate weight to the concerns of all users. In the flyer for this uh, session, we, we just threw a few things into the air and talking about the implementation of certain low traffic neighborhoods, electric scooters, uh, electric vehicle charging points and their location, cycle and pedestrian priorities, and removal of blue badge parking spaces in certain areas has caused quite a lot of contention. And of course, the uh, coronavirus pandemic and measures to promote social distancing and active travel has actually amplified those issues. With local authorities now wishing to make permanent some of these schemes temporarily implemented during lockdown conditions this issue is getting even more important i mean we can we all know of examples i mean i'm thinking of the foot street scheme in york city center or madeira drive in brighton and they're just two examples of where closing streets to vehicular traffic indiscriminately has actually caused problems for some users Although, to be fair to Brighton and Hove, I, I think that they've done a bit of work to ameliorate the situation. Uh, I'll also add that while doing access audits at railway stations, I come across a lot of measures implemented to promote cycling, which has inadvertently created obstacles for other users, making the station less accessible. But those new cycle facilities didn't even provide for non standard types of cycles. So, you know. I mean, we all know how it happens. The budget for the cycle infrastructure was made available. It was bid for and a specialist contractor brought in to provide for new, new equipment. But there was no holistic overview of how it would affect all users. And I'll just give one other example before I hand over. Uh, I was recently asked to cast an eye over a local authority's consultation draft planning strategy. A lot of local authorities are updating their planning strategies and also their local transport plan to version four at the moment. But this particular strategy, on the face of it, you might not have expected to have much to say about access with this strategy. But when you pick through it, it contained a number of policies which, if interpreted literally, would have affected everything people from people's bathing needs, from how they lit their front doorstep. But the same planning strategy didn't even go as far as to mandate uh, wheelchair accessible homes or even put a threshold on a 
lower limit on the on adaptable homes but you know those are just a couple of examples i've picked out over recent weeks anyway i'd like to hand over to Anne fry who who will uh, expand on these further especially as it was Anne who came up with the idea for the topic of today's session and i'll just introduce Anne. uh and worked on accessibility and mobility issues for many years. She spent much of her career in the UK Department for Transport, focusing on research, policy and legislation on the rights of disabled people across all transport modes. She then set up her own independent consultancy and she's now working with governments and transport providers globally to promote better access solutions. On top of that, and chairs the uh, CILT's Access and Inclusion Forum. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Just before I get into that, uh, one accessibility point that's been raised is that some people find the blurred background behind presenters uh, is, is disturbing and can trigger a, a migraine. There are quite often good reasons why people don't want the, a particular background behind them. Uh, but can I ask any presenter who is comfortable with removing the blurred background, perhaps you would you would do so? Um, I don't know if any of you want to, to, to comment on that, but I, it's, it's obviously a, a fair point. Oh, Pedro has a wall. Well, that's OK. We'll forgive you the wall. OK. Um, as Jim has already explained, this is a, a topic that's been very much um, in the news, really worldwide, certainly Europe wide. And there is a massive drive for obvious reasons towards sustainability and the green agenda. My own personal perception is that sometimes that's driven forward at the expense of accessibility. Um, there is such a political momentum on green issues that we don't always take the time to stop and think about how do we make that inclusive? And that's really what we want to get at this evening, is what those issues are. How can you obviously commit to the green agenda? We have to do that. It's crucially important. But do so in a way that doesn't disenfranchise people whose, whose daily life and mobility uh, depends on being able to move about safely and with confidence in their own neighbourhoods. And one of my preoccupations is with the, you know, the new schemes are introduced, whether it's shared space or whatever it is. And then there are some interviews done on the street afterwards and everybody they speak to thinks it's wonderful. Well, of course they do, they're there. What nobody does is speak to what I would call the displaced people, the people who are not there because they've lost their confidence to go out, they're too frightened, their neighbor was nearly knocked over, whatever it might be. So, you know, we've really, as, as planners, as operators, those in charge of the design of, of, of schemes, need to be sure that you're listening to the silent voices um, as well as the louder ones. Uh, so we have three very good presenters, but we also have a, a big focus on uh, discussion. I'm pleased to say we already have questions pouring in, including some that I really like, uh, but let's hear, uh, as Jim has said, this is a PowerPoint free zone, which is not good in itself, but each of our three speakers uh, is going to make a preliminary statement, and then we're going to focus the bulk of this evening on your questions and on getting responses to them. Uh, Jim, do you want to introduce our first speaker? Okay, our first speaker is Pedro Homendo Huer, and uh, he coordinates the Road Safety and Security Working Group of POLIS, which is the leading network of European cities and regions working on transport innovation. He's an architect with extensive experience in universal design, public space, pedestrian accessibility, street safety, urban governance, public participation and inquiry for design. And that includes engagement such as surveys, focus groups, structured observation, user testing. Uh, Pedro worked for more than 20 years at local level in his native Lisbon as a strategist, designer, trainer, a consult, accessibility consultant and political advisor. Also in Lisbon, he developed and implemented the Pedestrian Accessibility Plan and kick-started 
the Vision Zero planning process. And that's just a small amount of what's on Pedro's CV. Pedro, over to you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, every time this uh, short bio note gets read, I feel like the, the, like the man with the seven instruments playing all the... Um, well, as a, as, a, as a starting statement, I think this is a very, very timely discussion. Um, uh, I had to deal with it when I was designing and promoting uh, traffic calming at the local level. And now I, I see that uh, at Polis, uh, that uh, several cities are dealing with the same types of challenges. So this is a very timely uh, uh, topic. Um, I would say the following. Uh, number one, the, one of the key challenges um, of our times is to accelerate the shift to sustainable mobility. Uh, that is clearly um, key for our survival, uh, if not ours, uh, of our uh, subsequent generations, our children, our grandchildren, and so it's not just to promote the, the shift to sustainable mobility or to study or to explore, it's literally to accelerate and to find new ways to uh, make this shift happen and happen fast. But the way we frame this challenge uh, obviously is essential. As, in any, as any designer can tell you, uh, or any thinker for that matter, the way we frame the question uh, is essential to come up with the answer. And uh, one thing that I find essential to highlight, uh, this is not a question of CO2 emissions. Uh, CO2 emissions are the output, are the end product um, of a long chain of unsustainable uh, practices. And uh, if we just you know, go on with business as usual, but now electric, it will hardly solve any problems. If we just say that people won't have cars, but now they'll all be using e-scooters or electric bikes that go everywhere and it's a mess and that makes people, other people be afraid and stay at home, it's not solving anything. And we also must understand that what has been dry, the same thing that has been driving these uh, very, uh, negative environmental impacts over the past decades, it has also been driving it, the very negative economic and social impacts. So we have a highly discriminatory trans mobility system. I mean, ask any woman, uh, ask any uh, person with a disability, ask any family with low income. Um, it's a highly discriminatory uh, uh, mobility system. And so the shift to sustainable urban mobility cannot aggravate the existing inequalities. It has to fix them because those inequalities are also at the root of the environmental unsustainability, if you like. What we see, for example, in many uh, suburban areas is that many families are pressed for a losing choice between becoming car dependent or becoming public transport captive users and dreaming of one day owning a car. So really we have to have a, a systemic approach and, uh, and we have to look at it finally, you know, it's a bit from a, as a designer, I mean, um, you have, it's like doing a puzzle or fixing one of those Rubik cubes we had in our childhood when, you know, with all the colors, you can't just fix one part of the puzzle. The real challenge is to fix the whole puzzle, to look at all the issues. Of course, it's perfect, uh, uh, it is said usually that, you know, uh, perfect is the enemy of, uh, of, uh, of good, but mediocre is also the enemy of good solutions. And we should aim for perfect to get good rather than settle for the mediocre, which basically serves nobody. And I hope that helps to get the discussion rolling. Thank you very much, Pedro. There's some good... Uh good controversial stuff in there. We have questions coming in, which is excellent. Uh, Jim, do you want to introduce our next speaker? Let's, let's go through, our, through our, our introductory topics before we open the floor more widely. Okay, our next speaker is Joanna Ward. Uh, Joanna is highly experienced and mot motivated transport professional with a special interest in sustainable and active transport solutions. She's worked in the transport sector for over 20 years and has a proven track record working across public, private and charity sector for a wide client base. 
Joe is a board director of the Transport Planning Society and is an active member of Women in Transport. She's a strong advocate for walking and cycling, and she leads by example through her daily use of those modes, as well as of public transport. Jo, jo has written and presented extensively on the need for more diversity and inclusion in transport and planning and governance, including the recently published book, We All Ride Bikes Now. Jo, over to you. Thank you for the plug for my book, Jim. Appreciate that. Um, hello, everybody. It's um, my pleasure to be joining you this evening. Part of my role on the Transport Planning Society board that Jim mentioned, it was to take the lead or has been to take the lead on equality and diversity. And that's not just within the society, but in the profession as a whole. So looking across the whole of the transport sector. And I've spent a great deal of time on this in the five years that I've been on the board of the Transport Planning Society, raising the profile of these important issues and presenting the case for transport systems that are equal and inclusive for everybody. So I'm really pleased that we've got this event tonight and that it's leading into a wider discussion around um, the theme for Transport Planning Day this year, because it feels like the combination of a many, many years of work. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to taking part in the discussion. Um, after the 18 months that we've had, um, our family and friends and vital services seem to have been more cut off from us than ever. And with a climbing cr climate crisis that hasn't gone away, having an easy, safe and environmentally friendly, accessible transport system in all its guises seems more relevant for all of us than ever. And I'm just going to have a little bit of a look at how I think the industry needs to react to some of this stuff. I'm sure that you've all read by now the book or listened to the book Invisible Women, but I just want to remind you of the um, example that um, the, the author uses at the beginning of that, where she looks at the um, town in Sweden, um, where in 2011, a gender equality initiative in the town required a review of all policies and activities through a gender lens. So just looking at one small um, equality issue, despite a government official joking that at least snow clearing wouldn't wouldn't need to be put through that. To their surprise, studies showed that the practice of snow clearing um, from roads before footpaths actually dis uh, disproportionately impacts women. Women are more likely to walk, while men are more likely to drive. And I know these are very sweeping statements, but this is, this is kind of setting the example of, of, of giving this example. As a result, women's mobility is not only more limited when the snow came, they're actually at greater risk of slipping on snow and ice. During three inches of snow, it's significantly easier um, to drive than it is to push a buggy, bike or wheelchair um, and take somebody with you. So why were they ploughing for cars first? Well, once aware of this gendered impact, the, the town switched to clear snow from the pedestrian areas first. Changing the order of ploughing came at no extra cost and helped address a gender imbalance created every time the snow fell in winter and therefore impacting many sustainable trips. This small town in Sweden is just one example of a gendered nature of planning, and that's not limited to snow clearing. We've all got examples of where we have prioritised, and I use the royal we, we in the planning and transport built environment um, uh, field, have prioritised cars for years. The book, Invisible Women, and if you haven't got a copy or heard, listened to a copy, I definitely recommend it, goes on to point out that in most societies, even if households have a car, it tends to be used by the men of the family. Women are more likely to use public transport, but public transport has not been designed for things like unpaid care work. For example, um, journeys that require chained trips, school run to work, school run to shops, to home, etc. That in turn makes it difficult to complete unpaid care work and therefore makes it much harder to engage in paid work. And so it's a vicious circle. And that's just one example of inequality in transport that we need to address. There's no doubt whatever spin we put on the last 18 months, no amount of baking banana bread or learning new languages can take away from the fact that it's been very difficult for all of us. But we do have an opportunity, I think, as planning and built environment professionals now um, and our colleagues to stand up and be counted and seize the day and make the change for something that's better for all of us. Recent events have united to produce the opportunity of what I feel is a lifetime. Uh, for our profession to change the world in which we live for the better. So the situation that we're in, set against climate emergencies being declared across the world, um, become almost a perfect opportunity for us to change things. In order to make these more, more than just generous words, 
everybody seems to be declaring a climate emergency. We need to become carbon neutral as soon as possible. And it's clear that if we want to make that significant process, the transport sector needs to take a part in that. And we need to be ready to contribute positive, innovative and sustainable solutions for as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. Indeed, if we're to achieve that, we, we built environment professionals need to draw on all our skills and experience to reduce the demand for individualized motorized transport and fund solutions that work for everybody, no matter what their background or situation. This will mean tackling five major barriers. And I'm looking forward to discussing these with these further this evening. One is petrol and diesel cars. We need to have a grown up discussion and take action on the type of transport that suits people so that and is accessible to people so that we use appropriate modes for appropriate journeys. We need to have infrastructure for sustainable travel that is of a quality that means it's accessible to everyone. And we need to work hard to remove the barriers, visible or in invisible. We need to, you need to use technology well, and that means making sure that uh, making sure that everybody's able to access this and that we're bearing in mind the needs of the many, not just a few people. We need to work as a workforce to skill up and make sure that our workforce and the general public are equipped for the changes we need to make and that they are prepared for this. And again, that things are as accessible as possible for more than just one small group. And we need to have the policies in place to assist us in this brave new world. So I've just, the, what I think I'm trying to say is it's not gonna be easy. It's going to be a lifetime's work for us. And we're, we are all gonna to have to work together because the risk is that we miss this opportunity and the chance to literally make a better world. It sounds fanciful, but I really believe this. There is a danger that we might have better, more cleanable, livable places to do our business. And they might be better for our health, mental and physical, our pockets, time saving and the environment all at the same time. And they might be more user friendly for everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Susan Claris. And uh, Susan is Vice President of Living Streets, the UK charity for everyday walking. And she's also been a trustee of a charity for the past six years. Susan started her working life at the Department for Transport nearly 40 years ago. And for the last 30 years, she's been working as a transport planner for Arup, an independent uh, consultancy working across every aspect of today's built environment. Susan is now the global active travel leader for, for Arup. Uh, Susan? It, over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction and inviting me to be along here this evening. It's a great pleasure. Um, just to explain a bit about Living Streets, if I may, as you say, it's the, the UK charity for everyday walking. Um, and by way of background, it was actually formed in 1929. Um, so we are, we are coming up towards our centenary. It was formed oh. in 1929 as the Pedestrians Association. Because at that point, if you had enough money to buy a car, you could just go straight out and, and drive that car. There was no driving test. There was no highway code. There weren't pedestrian crossings. So Living Streets was actually formed to campaign for the introduction of zebra crossings and the introduction of speed limits to try and make that more inclusive environment. So these discussions have been going on, sadly, a, a very long time in terms of how we can make streets and roads that work for everybody. And, and, and my view is, is that you actually, rather than it's sustainability versus inclusion, my belief is that you cannot have sustainability without it being inclusive. By very definition, it is not sustainable if it is not inclusive. And for too long, as far as transport is concerned, we've designed it for operational terms. What we need to do is actually place people back at the heart of our communities and our villages and our towns and cities and we need to have a human centered approach and this needs to include all people so we mustn't design for the for the average that doesn't exist and that's powerfully put in the invisible women book we mustn't design for this this average or, or reference man so i'd really like to make three points please in my opening the, the first one is that to make our streets and our places fully inclusive we need to improve governance planning and decision making it needs to start at that level. 
And our transport plans should have a focus on reducing inequity. That should be the starting point, not something we measure at the end. So we do need to increase diversity and representation in decision making and the transport sector. We need to listen to those diverse voices and particularly those quiet voices that Anne talked about, the voices that are not making themselves heard or that are hard to hear. And we definitely need better evidence and we need better engagement. So that's the first thing. The second thing is actually focusing on making better places. So that will include things like improving road safety, addressing personal safety and harassment, making sure that infrastructure is is fully inclusive. And I'm sure we'll have some discussions later on about things like electric vehicle charging points and how they go on, often seem to go in the middle of the footway. And there was an announcement today, I think, of an extra 620 million. Things can be done differently and in a more inclusive way. So we need to better integrate active travel and, and, and public transport And we need to prioritise transport schemes where transport options are poor. So again, it's looking at this from the planning side, not just listening to where there is demand for something. And then the third thing is about welcoming and supporting all people. And this includes the language we use, it includes the imagery we use, and it includes consideration of cost to make sure that transport options are freely available or are equally available to all people. Um, so for Living Streets, there's a, one of our campaigns at the moment is called Cut the Clutter. And that's looking at the obstacles that so many people do face on, on the footway when walking. And that can include things like signs, traffic signs, which I think should be mounted on, on cones and put in the, in the carriageway that shouldn't be on the footway. It includes things like EV charge points. My view is they should be in, in parklets. Why not create recharge parklets that has seating and has benefits for all people? So there are different ways of doing things. And some of this is to do with the management of it as well. So we are starting to see some changes, but there's a lot more that can be done. So I'd really like to conclude with the the words of the US um, Transportation Secretary, Secretary Pete. Um, He says that every transportation policy choice is an equity decision, whether decision makers recognise it or not. And it's time to do the right thing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think we've had some some very powerful uh, introductory statements there. And my goodness, we've got some good questions coming up. Um, The first one I want to take, uh, simply because she gets the prize for being our most distant participant, unless anyone can prove me wrong, is my colleague Bridget Burdett, who is in New Zealand. So congratulations, Bridget, for being with us at probably a ridiculous time of day for you. Her question is, one of the challenges with the tension between sustainability and accessibility is that mode shift away from cars is easy to measure on the street, but we don't measure accessibility outcomes very well. What measures do you propose for inclusive access so that trade-offs can be made more explicit than they are now? Would like to tackle that. Pedro, are you up for that first? Yes, um, go straight to the source and talk to the users or better still, listen to the users actually. Um, there are several uh, methods that can be used. Um, uh, one, one of the common uh, misconceptions is that either you do public participation or you don't. Um, I mean, there are several ways that you can do uh, walkthroughs, you can do uh, focus groups, you can do surveys, you can do public sessions. There, there are several uh, methods available. Um, and I find um, having worked first, my first job was as a political advisor. And later I did, you know, design and planning. And I find in in both jobs, I found elected officials are very sensible, not only, you know, to a report on what the public wants, but to quotes and to um, input from users, from their constituencies. Um, And they have a a very special political impact. Um, And so understanding these users, I would, also point out what Anne said at the outset, that it is very important to listen to the people who are are not there um, because the people who are there are a non-representative sample. Um, uh, I would start there, you know, really to listening to the users. Okay, thank you, Pedro. Uh, Joe, do you have anything to add on that subject? Just to reiterate um, the points that Pedro's made and about the um, 
people who aren't there and listening to people who aren't in the room so asking ourselves what kind of um why aren't they there is it that we're making um things like consultations inaccessible um i guess i'm a bit disappointed that things haven't changed as much as they could have done i think that we've had a fantastic i love to say opportunity but the situation that we've been in for the last 18 months has meant that some things have become more accessible to people from different places haven't they um i've certainly found that and and i'm determined that we're not going to lose that so we need to work on this kind of how do we get everybody involved in this conversation and action to make it better for everybody because the places are about people being able to do their business socialize reach services that kind of thing and uh, we need to remember to be people focused and that's for the widest possible amount of people thank you i guess one of the problems is it's always much more expensive to find ways to reach out to the people who are sitting at home uh, rather than you know just going around the streets with a clipboard uh, so one you know part of the issue there is is how do you find them how do you identify them how do you get them to participate susan did you want to come in on that interesting question from bridget Yes, I think it's I think focusing on the outcomes is absolutely right. My own profession transport planning for too long we just go on numbers and we count things and if we look say at, at people um at cars going along a street and we count them and they go down then we we say that's a good thing and we do that because we can easily count cars we put a strip down in the road and it counts the vehicle movements. Um, similarly with cycle lanes, if we put in a cycle lane and the people, the number of cyclists using it goes from 50 to 100, we declare that to be a good thing. But actually, I think we need to go further and see what, what that changes in terms of outcomes. Who are those people who are moving? We're very poor, for example, at counting people who are walking. And by walking, I'm using that as a bit of a shorthand for people who are walking or wheeling or children using scooters. It's important to think of them all. Um, and that's something that never tends to get measured. So we are, the tendency, the default is always just to count car movements and we need to go beyond that. And we need to look at why people are traveling, what they're seeking to reach and the outcomes. And it, it is very difficult to do. Um, we, we suffer from, from poor data. And I think in terms of, I mean, some of the um, commonplace um, tools that councils have used where people can use it on their mobile phone or computer, I know that doesn't work for everybody, but it means people don't actually have to be out there expressing an opinion. They can actually say if there are barriers in their own streets or their own environments which are causing problems. So I think using more digital tools for people to engage and, and give comments, fully accepted doesn't work for everybody, but it's certainly better than the turning up to a village hall on a wet Wednesday evening to, to comment on sort of detailed drawing plans. But we've, we've got a long way still to go on that. Thank you. Pedro, you wanted to come back on that? Yes, I'd like to build on what Susan mentioned. Um, I'm an architect by training. I mean, I, I'm not a transport planner. And when I started working on pedestrian accessibility over a decade ago, uh, and um, so working on, on pedestrians, right? I had to deal, I was, my, my whole team was transferred to the transport department and suddenly we were surrounded by transport engineers, by traffic engineers. And it's a world where what you can count counts, what you cannot count doesn't count. Um, and it's, uh, and, and that approach is wrong. Um, and I wonder, you know, Susan, um, because, I mean, because that approach obviously has serious limitations. First of all, because as Susan mentioned, it is much more difficult to count pedestrians or cyclists for that matter than to count uh, anything that, uh, you know, cars and trucks and what have you. But I mean, right now, because again, the challenge we face is to accelerate the shift to sustainable mobility. So, so to change behavior, maybe uh, we should really tackle this problem head on. And uh, I wouldn't say, you know, throw, throw the counters and the numbers out the window but really not accept traffic counts anymore um, as, uh, let's say, a benchmark for uh, what should be done. Um, I know this may, you know, uh, scare, be a bit scary, but the point is, I mean, if we, what we, we should be, the fact that X amounts of people are driving cars doesn't necessarily mean that we have to serve them. We actually have to not serve some of them. We have to reduce the performance levels. Um, so I'm not sure really that counting uh, that, I mean, maybe you should try to move the counting out of center stage. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I've got lots of, lots of questions and opinions coming in. 
somebody's just asked whether we can make the, the Q&A visible to everyone. I'm just finding out if that's possible. But just to, to repeat why we're using this rather than chat, uh, if you're a screen reader and relying on an audible feed, chat is extremely annoying because everything is read out to you um, and cuts through other speech. So uh, we've done it on accessibility grounds, but I, I've just got a message that yes, we can make the Q&A uh, visible to everybody. So let's do that if people want to see the questions. Um, I wanted to move on to um, a rather more specific question. And it's one that's that's been, certainly if you follow LinkedIn is, is uh, very prevalent. And that's in the, 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 the fashion for colored crossings. Uh, we're seeing it all over the place, stripes and dots and whirls uh, at pedestrian crossings in the name of art and in the name of, of better visibility. I have strong opinions myself, but that's not relevant. So who, who would like to uh, come in on, on that one? Um, Susan, do you have a view on that? I think my unhelpful view is probably it depends and it, it, it depends on the location and the consultation to see if it works for the users or potential users. So I think sometimes colourful entrance ways at schools, for example, can be a useful way of, of highlighting the, the presence of a school. But I think it should always be done in consultation to make sure that it, it doesn't um, create problems. I know it does create um, problems for some people with, with visual impairments and it can be confusing. Um, so I think it's something that probably I would say needs to be judged on a case by case basis, depending on the location and exactly what is involved. Um, so but it, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm not an expert in this area. OK, anyone else got views? Tim, I thought you might. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, these colourful crossings, they're not necessarily a sustainability issue, but they're an issue nonetheless. And they're something which not, not just people with vision impairments, but also people with cognitive and other, other issues have, have raised concerns about. And... Uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier that I'm a member of the UK's Access Association, and we recently sent a letter to the Department of Transport and others outlining our concerns about this. And the response for, from the Department of Transport was pretty much, as Susan says, it really needs to be looked at on a case-by-case basis at a local level by undertaking an equality impact assessment of each site. Now, on taking at face value, that looks like a pragmatic approach and can also say the DFT quite clearly doesn't want to be taking a top-down approach. But as we may get on to talking about equality impact assessments later, but not all of them seem to be up to the job. Would we trust them all? I mean, that, that's a that's subject for another debate. But my worry is, well, that was their response to concerns about shared space a decade ago, and look where that got us. And so... <laughs> I <laughs> just want to throw that curveball in there. But, uh, you know, I don't understand why people aren't seeing the concern until it's too late. As I say, I don't really want to get bogged down on this. It's not necessarily a sustainability issue, but it's quite clearly something which has got, a, you know, which is, which is a thing, you know. Anyway, I'll put my hand down there. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Peter, you've got your hand up. Yes. Um, well, if Jim doesn't want to, let me open the Pandora's box. Um, I, I think it's important to, to tackle the issue red, red, uh, head on about uh, colored markings. I'm, I'm not sure I know what I'm talking about here on the colored markings that you're talking about. Um, and I do remember uh, a few years ago, uh, one of the, one of our boroughs decided to commemorate the um, the gay rights uh, day. They put a, a rainbow uh, crosswalk, and there was huge uproar from the road safety community. The same road safety community that had been silent about uh, pedestrians being killed 
on, on, on properly painted crosswalks. So I know obviously that's not what you're talking about, but um, when I, again, I mean, uh, for, for over a decade, I worked with traffic engineers, but they were, they, were, they, they were always very conscious about something, you know, about having neat and rigorous road markings. They ignored everything else. They ignored the speeds, they ignored the design of the roadway, they ignored the way the design of the roadway of the, of the driving environment encouraged speeds. And they thought that segregating transport modes, it's key for safety. Then they would put in 50 centimeter wide uh, or two feet wide uh, uh, sidewalks and say they're there. They've got pedestrians got the spa their space. Of course, with cars all over the place, uh, parking on both sides, etc. So, um, in this situation, I think that uh, to maybe to open the discussion and just shut up and listen. Um, I mean, there is, as you know, as many of you may know, this principle of uncertainty that uh, if things are uncertain for the car driver, he will be, he will tend to decelerate, to drive uh, slower and to pay more attention to old, to the behaviors of old road users. Of course, that is a, uh, it makes sense in principle and it's connected to well-established principles, you know, and, and mechanisms in neuroscience, but uh, it also lies on the assumption that we have reduced the volumes of traffic, that we have physical measures in place to ensure speeds are lower, that the driving environment, that everything in the driving environment ensures that the drivers will slow down. In that situation, shared spaces, not as a design gimmick for uh, places where all these other measures haven't been in place, um, picking up what Suzanne said, I mean, if the context isn't there, we create it. But we, if we are not able to create safe conditions for a deployment of these measures, uh, then uh, obviously uh, just deploying them as a design gimmick is profoundly wrong. That said, I would only add a phrase that in many urban areas where you still have people, well, you have people walking everywhere, but where you still want to ensure that circulation of vehicles remains possible, that parking of vehicles remains possible in consolidated and er older urban areas where it's just, if we go on segregating uh, the modes, it is very difficult, you know, very, very difficult not to say impossible to ensure that the, the proper width for pedestrians. Of course, the proper width for pedestrians should be the first thing everybody thinks about. In practice, in our organizations, it's not. Um, so, I mean, I don't have any certainties, maybe because I've been talking about the principle of uncertainty, but there are, I think, very important ways, reasons for us to consider how we can make shared spaces and let's say non-traditional uh, non -traditional road markings um, accessible and comfortable for people uh, who, who cannot deal with the uncertainty, but uh, at the same time, not throw out the window, the, the, the very important safety contributions that um, this can uh, help us make. Okay, thank, thank you for that. I think that my deep skepticism about uh, shared space has always been that it relies on the principle of making eye contact. Um, and there you have it, something that isn't gonna work. Uh, not just for people with low vision, but for children, people looking at their mobile phones, all the rest of it. Anything that, that, that depends on mutual recognition, I think is, is, is not going to work well. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we really need to, you know, to my mind, there is still a sort of priority in, that, in shared space of, of vehicles over pedestrians. But anyway, this is, this is my opinion, and that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, on that subject, somebody's come in and said, what about children? They're very seldom talked about. And a lot of the issues we've touched on are equally relevant to the safety and mobility of children. Do, do any of our panelists have a, a particular point or comment on that? I, 
think um i think that's, I think that's a perfectly you know really good thing to raise i think mm. um young people and um, when i'm not transport planning i do quite a lot of work with you know um volunteering with young people i think that they um i think they're way ahead of it further ahead than we are and I think we need to be working at how we're going to get their opinions and ideas um, into the um, places that we're designing and making possible for everybody. They are way ahead in terms of what we need to do to um, tackle the climate crisis. And they are way ahead in terms of making things accessible for everybody. We need to make sure that their voices are heard and we need to work out the best way to do that and, and not assume as the, well, maybe not the grown ups in the room, that we think we know what we're talking about because they have got very strong opinions and some really good ideas about how we take that, those things forward. We need to work that into the plans that we make for everything we do. And we need to be thinking about who we're designing for. How are we going to encourage more um, children to um, walk, cycle, scoot, wheel, all of those things to school? How accessible is that? How realistic is that? And, and how can we make that happen? Um, because you've only got to look at um, the um, uh, you know the movement that was being set up by um, uh, six formers and, and younger um, pre uh, COVID, um, they were campaigning, weren't they? Every was it every Friday afternoon to make us take notice, and um, and we've got a responsibility to make sure that we do. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes, a very important point. Um, I'm going can, to can I just add to that, Anne? Sorry, I was thinking, with Living Streets, there's a lot of campaigning around the, the journey to school and encouraging children to walk to school and to become more aware of their impact on the environment through doing that. Um, and I think, again, walking, including the, the scooting or the wheeling. Um, and I think we've particularly seen that I live in an area that sort of has a number of low traffic neighbourhoods around it. And I'm sure we'll get onto low traffic neighbourhoods. But seeing the way children interact with the street once the street is largely removed of traffic. And I say largely because I think it's important to stress that low traffic neighbourhoods are not no traffic neighbourhoods. Traffic is still allowed for access. It is through traffic that is taken out of them. So there is still some traffic, but seeing the way that children behave, seeing three and four year olds actually cycling along the road with their with their friends, with their with their parents, seeing how they use the streets and, and more options for play streets and things at weekends. So I think that can be a really powerful way where children actually show how they want to use that street space. Um, and so that can be that can be a better way of actually trying to get people's views. You know, you're not going to be asking a questionnaire, but actually just give the give the street to a children, a child or children and see how they play out in it and see how they how they respond to that. And for me, that's that's been really interesting, seeing the way that the children have almost taken over the streets in some ways, which is which is fantastic. Thank you. That's a really interesting one. Um, Somebody has, I've just noticed that a lot of people are, are very helpfully posting um, website addresses and video clips and so on. I'm hoping that everybody can now see the Q&A, but uh, I will make sure that in the proceedings and, and so on, that we publish all of these um, very useful contacts and uh, documents that are being uh, coming up on screen, which is great. Thank you so much. Um, I was going to turn to, to Skate. Um, beg your pardon. Yes, here we are. This is um, David in Edinburgh, and I strongly suspect that's David Hunter, uh, who is asking about whether it's possible to design uh, a bus stop bypass that is safe for pedestrians and cyclists. I have a feeling, David, you're talking about the infamous floating bus stops of Edinburgh. Uh, which in my view are a complete abomination, but then my view doesn't really matter. But who would like to uh, comment on bus stop bypasses, floating bus stops? Is there a safe way to accommodate both the passengers waiting for the bus and the cyclists going along? Jim. Sorry, you may see from another question that uh, one uh, I think it's Mark Strong has said about the bus stop bypasses in Brighton and says that they seem to work better there. And he also makes a point about Brighton and Hove buses actually having an accessibility person, and that would be Victoria, Victoria Garcia, who, whom we know. And I think that actually makes a massive difference having 
an actual access officer at a local authority or at a transport provider, that makes such a big deal when you're trying to do these sorts of schemes because it means that uh, provided that person is involved with these projects and Brighton and Hove, as well as having Victoria, they make sure that they work really well. Brighton and Hove buses work really well with Brighton and Hove Council on everything they do, not just around accessibility, but also they've got Patrick Warner, who's who, who's their sustainability person. And they, they are really ahead of the game. And I haven't seen any of the Brighton floating bus stops. So I would like to see how what's different about them to say the ones which Transport for London have put it outside St Thomas's Hospital entrance and other places in London, or which Southampton City Council have put on the approach to the Itchin Bridge at bus stop, you know, places like that. Because why does it work in one place and not another? And I'd be interested to see. So once uh, I feel more confident about going out. I'll certainly go and visit and I'll ask a few more people as well. But uh, if you know the magic formula, which uh, Brighton and Hove have got, which the others haven't, I'll be pleased to find out. But I suspect the magic formula isn't actually having Victoria as access person and Brighton and Hove buses and having that dialogue between the council, and the bus operator. That's it. That's for me. Thank you, Jim. Pedro, you wanted to come in. Yes, uh, I'm also looking for good examples of good interactions uh, between uh, bike lanes and uh, bus stops. Uh, I've tried a bit of my own, but um, I think that, well, first of all, these, uh, the, this difficult uh, articulation between bus stops and bike lanes is happens because there is a bike lane in the first place and because somewhere somewhere along the design process, somewhere has, somebody has decided that, that there will be segregation of modes and specifically that bikes will be segregated from motorized traffic. Now, this is not always uh, a good decision. This is not always the most effective way to go because it also creates several problems uh, for the for people cycling. Uh, for example, in many, I mean, I, I, I usually cycle to my office um, and somebody painted a bike lane just with paint to the side of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the lane of the traffic lane, just to force me to cycle right next to the doors of the parked cars. It's not safe for me. I refuse to go to use that lane. I go out. But the point is that if there are problems with articulation between bus stops and bike lanes, is that because for some reason there is a bike lane there? And that's not always for the best of reasons. Sometimes people designing the, the cycling networks are, seem a bit like a person that has a hammer in his hand and everything looks like a nail. Uh, you know, bike lanes uh, are segregation of modes and bike lanes are a good solution, I would say, in most cities for around 10 to 15% of the network. For the rest of the network, and, and and even in those percentages, it's not just about where they cycle, it's, it's the intersections as well. For the rest of the network, what can we do? Well, obviously, reduce traffic volumes, reduce uh, through traffic, and essentially reduce speed. Because if we do that, the only places where we will be dealing with the articulation between bus stops and bike lanes will be in the places where it is easier to deal with it, which is, which is obviously where the right of way is wider and where there is much more space to deal with it. I hope that helps. Thank you. Joe or Susan, do either of you want to, to add to that discussion before we move on? I, I would agree with the, the key thing being reducing the dominance of, of vehicles in terms of speed, ideally in terms of the size of the vehicles. Um, I think often when we're talking about um, sustainable transport or active transport, the focus is on putting in walking and cycling measures. But for me, the most fundamental thing is actually to reduce the dominance of, of, of private vehicles. Um, I use the expression transport gluttony, which by that I mean the overconsumption of transport to the de detriment of other people. So that includes things like footway parking, it includes not stopping at crossings or inappropriate speeds or engine idling. All of these things are done which make the urban environment less attractive for, for everybody else. 
And I think until we get things like a national system of road pricing, I think we will not start to, to address those. So I think it does need to be done through taxation. I see one of the comments in the in the, the questions about reducing the amount of parking. Um, I believe that needs to be done through road space reallocation, um, through encouraging councils to put in, I said, parklets, which have advantages in terms of greenery, in terms of seating. Um, they just make for a nicer urban environment for everybody and can help in terms of drainage and things. So, but I think until we we really addressed the issue of the dominance of car traffic and the amount of parked vehicles, you know, we're, we're still buying more and more cars and we're using them less, which in one way, maybe it's a good thing we're using them less, but you end up with cars that are parked for, you know, 95% of their time. They're taking up valuable urban space. They're creating difficulties for other people to move around the urban environment. And we need to look differently at how we how we use our streets. Um, the difficulty is it's it's a hard sell politically. Um, and that's the really difficult one to overcome. Thank you. That actually brings us to the, the, the question you've just referred to um, from Keith Homer. Um, and I'd like to open it up because I think it's, it's a really interesting one. And he's, he's stressed he doesn't just want you to agree with him. He wants you to come up with solutions. So I put you on warning. He says, my hypothesis, I suggest something that I think would improve both inclusion in terms of income distribution, at least, and in other aspects, too, and sustainability in terms of climate change so on, would be to ban all free parking, both publicly and privately provided, both on-road and off-road, e.g. on-road free parking takes carriageway capacity that could be better used by bikes or buses. Off-road local authority free parking uses taxation from all income groups to provide a facility used mainly by the better off. And off-road supermarket car parking use a retailer income from all shoppers to provide a facility used mainly by the better off all free parking shifts the modal split towards car, e.g. a paid for parking. I've had a comment straight in uh, from Carol Thomas saying, yeah, but what about blue badge holders? Sometimes they have no choice but to park. So uh, nobody's to agree, but to come up with concrete um, solutions to that very real and important point. Joanna, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I, I, I live in Nottingham. So we have a workplace parking levy in Nottingham um, and uh, that's been in place for um, uh, five or six years now. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it works for everybody. It's meant that we have been able, we, and I use the Royal We because I don't work for Nottingham City Council, but I live here and, as a resident. And um, it's meant that we've been able to make some uh, big improvements to other um, transport infrastructure and transport facilities. So we've got um, our tram extension, uh, uh, um, refurbishment of our station, some better buses. Some more cycling and walking routes out of it um so uh, yeah nottingham's view you know the general public's view in nottingham would be where are the rest of you what are you what are you doing about it and um, i i do agree to an extent i don't i don't own a car i've never owned a car um it started off as a i didn't have enough money when i was a student to be able to learn to drive and i um didn't earn enough money when I got my first job and then I've kind of made it part of my work as well so I feel quite strongly that we need to as a society stop assuming that everybody has a car and that they can all get to places because and that if you haven't got a car you're the one being difficult because you are the one who's chosen or doesn't have a car we need it's a, it's a social justice issue isn't it we can't assume that everybody's got a car and we've got to make it as easy as possible however I live in a street um, in Nottingham where lots of my neighbours have two cars and so I go through the battle every day of people assuming it's okay to park in front of my house I know I don't own the carriageway but it's all right because I haven't got a car to get out but I still have to have things delivered I still have to get my bike out still able to get out of my gate still need to be able to put my bins out and I don't really want to live in a car park so and I have visitors that might need and want to drive to come to see me so I think there's all sorts of things um going on with this I think it's very frustrating um, the, there's quite a lot of pavement parking going on um, in the estate that I live on as well. I think that's very frustrating for pushing a, um, a buggy down the street, trying to access drop curves on crutches, which I have had to do um, not so long ago. It's just it's just really unthoughtful, isn't it? And, and really unhelpful to lots of people. Um, yeah, I think I've got stronger views over the years that I think that we are we are accommodating people's private possessions on the streets. And I'd go as far to say is I'm quite angry about it at the moment. 
Thank you. That's clear. Can I just put in a word here as, as a, somebody in a rural village in Somerset um, where there is no alternative but driving a car? We have no shop. We have no yeah. um, And yet all the new housing being built around villages like those is being built with two, three and four parking spaces because the average family needs a car to get the kids to school, a car for someone else to go to work and so on. So certainly in rural areas, we're perpetuating car dependency. I think in a, in a very big way. Um, and unless we improve public transport accessibility in rural areas, I mean, in, in my village, there are no pavements. Um, if you're old or disabled, it's almost impossible to get to the bus stop. And you know, buses are, to say the least, not frequent. Uh, so it's easy if they get rid of cars, ban free car parking, but actually outside the cities, it's all there is. And I'd agree, Anne, and I think it's um, it's had a good or bad huge influence on my life about where I've been able to live um, and ch had to choose to live because because I'm, I'm, I'm just I haven't haven't got one and I'm determined now I'm not going to. So I've made those life choices, but it wasn't it's it's in the beginning of my career. I think it probably limited my choices because I know that um, lots of employers. It hasn't happened to me recently, but I was almost having to apologize at interviews for not having a driving license and not having access to a car. And I've just. I've kind of got around that by thinking that um, actually um, having to go on site where you're often offered a parking space to start with, you know, um, companies you might be writing travel plans for say, oh, would you like a parking space? And you say, well, actually, no, I'm going to come on the train and I might cycle or I might, you know, work out how I'm going to get. There. I've done half my work before I've got there and it's proved one way or the other about how accessible it is. But mm -hmm. it's you have to be, you know, I've had to be quite um uh, kind of um, strong and resilient, I guess, to get around that. Um, and it probably has influenced what I've done and not always in a good way. Mm. Thank you. I've got Jim first and then Pedro coming in on this. Jim. Okay. Just following on what Joanna's just said, and also going back to an earlier point in the Q&A column. Uh, yeah. Uh, we do seem to be transitioning from when I go, if I go back a couple of decades, but a lot of jobs I would go for, they would expect you to have a full clean driving license, even though it wasn't a driving job. And I really had to battle. And sometimes I had to, you know, help fire and brimstone on whoever was interviewing me saying look why why do you make why do you insist that because that i don't drive and uh, i'm registered blind and i don't drive and i'm never going to be able to so why you're excluding me from a job which i could otherwise do and they never thought that there could be another way of doing that job without a car things have gradually changed and i think people realize that they can know but not everybody but most people realize that they can uh, you know a candidate can fulfill those roles without having a car and also it's to their advantage as far as sustainability is concerned i mean i'm just i'm just saying this because i did notice that somebody did put a question about that in the in the q and a about what would you do if it's made a requirement of of a job i mean i live in quite an urban area and i work i have some site and i worked all over hampshire and in both rural and the uh, and urban areas, and I managed to get to everywhere I needed to because I've always done that. And most people who've driven everywhere will need some sort of travel training in order to give up their cars. I've had fifty-two years of moving around the way I do, and even I think it's a challenge sometimes with a master's in transport planning and thirty-two years experience. But so is, how is somebody who's always driven, how are we going to get them out of their car, especially if, you know, there's an accessibility angle to it as well? You don't know. A lot of people don't know how they would get around without a car. I mean, to their credit, the train companies are starting to do uh, 
what is effectively travel training, uh, try with uh, try the train, travel with confidence uh, program. Most train operating companies are doing it. Uh, we we have one with Southwestern Railway down in Hampshire, with Southern down in Sussex, and. You know, they're focusing on uh, groups who've either not used the train for a long time or who've never used a train. And quite often it's older or disabled people or people with learning or cognitive disabilities who don't just don't know how to catch a train or how they would how they would do it. And there's that perceived, how on earth do I move around? How do I get that? How, how do I do that? Sorry, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent but there, but I just want to jump in because that also means we've, we've, we've answered one of the other questions there. And Joe actually did hit on that subject. Uh, how do you live without personal private transport? I mean, we could talk about the parking allocations in new housing and everything else, but I think uh, we want to be home by midnight tonight. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Han. Thank you, Pedro. Yeah, well, my experience as a um, public administration uh, official um, working for a city, you know, I'm, I'm a true believer in Julius Caesar's, uh, you know, motto of divide to conquer. And I think that one of the biggest problems we face is that we generalize and we 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 fight, we, we 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 look at the full bowl instead of you know breaking it uh, in pieces. I think in parking there are two two cuts that we have to make. The first one is between those for whom parking is indispensable, and which are at the same time those who are most underserved, and on the other hand those for whom parking is not indispensable. And I won't make any value judgments there. Now, those for whom parking is indispensable, who, as I said, are the most underserved, are obviously people with disabilities who have a blue badge, deliveries, and not only you know, heavy deliveries, but a rapid growth in delivery and in instant deliveries for, from, uh, for, 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 for restaurants. And obviously, then, thirdly, bikes, e-scooters, and what have you. Now, though people complain about, I don't know how it's working in the UK, but here in Europe, people complain with due reason about uh, e-scooters being left everywhere on the sidewalk. Well, that's great, because it gives, us, gives city officials a great excuse to convert car parking into bike and e-scooter parking. The law... Uh, anti-discrimination uh, laws uh, may ensure that people with disabilities must have equal access to all services, opportunities, etc. Well, I usually found that when I was working in Lisbon, a great tool to scare parking officials and some traffic engineers to really get more uh, parking spaces, convert it into uh, accessible parking spaces, and obviously delivers deliveries, which I talked about. So that's the indispensable and underserved. On the other hand, without any valid judgment, uh, I think uh, we could, uh, about all the other users, we could divide them again in two. Those for whom owning a car and driving a car is an easy choice because they can afford it. And uh, parking prices usually don't make much of a dent uh, in, in, in many of them. And those for whom owning a car and driving a car is a tough choice because they are forced to make the tough choice between spending a lot of their family income or spending a lot of their family time. Uh, I would buy a car too. If I was living, uh, if I was commuting for one hour and that was the choice was between spending one hour with my children or commuting for two hours in a bus and saving the money. So for these, I mean, I would say that it is important to understand that Fixed prices are a regressive tax, meaning if you price everybody the same way, uh, you have a bigger impact on those that have lower income. And that's exactly the people who are usually most vocal and most desperate about uh, rising elimination of parking spaces and rising of, of parking prices. And that's basically what is believed to have formed the, the, the Gilets Jaunes movement in, in France, sparked it. So, I would say that from for these people, um, I would you know there are two things that will 
progressively wash them away, uh, so to speak, and that what cities should be prepared is to really to take uh, advantage of that process. Number one, it is that, you know, for generational reasons, the younger generations aren't getting as much driver license, getting as much cars. They're much more open to, to shared mobility. So it, you know, the number of cars is going, it will be going down. Also, not only for cultural reasons, but also for economic reasons, it's difficult, much more difficult than for our generation to get a steady job nowadays. And if you don't get a steady job, the turnover is higher. Also in your housing front, which means a, a, a higher turnover rate in both ends of the commute means it's much, uh, it, it really is, doesn't pay to, to buy a car. Um, and so this will be washing people away. I think that in the process, what we should focus on is besides, I, I, we, could call, we could call them uh, fair parking prices, uh, fair meaning we tax more, those who can pay more. Um, it is essential, like picking up on one end set, to take our, we are all fixated in urban centers and we, in the last mile, and we fail to understand that the most critical transport decisions are made away from the city centers on the first mile. Uh, people think about how will they make the first, the movement to the center and how will they get back at night? And so um, we, we need to provide uh, alternatives uh, sustainable alternatives, sustainable and affordable in terms of both time and financial cost outside of the city centers, which are already gorging with public transport options um, and provide new uh, mobility options for people there to, to really uh, save them from having to buy a car and becoming um, car dependent. It's not an egg and chicken thing that first we have to provide better alternatives, then they can leave their car. It's just because you know the, the thing that makes walking in public transport and cycling so unattractive is the car. So we obviously have to start by curtailing um, that end. I don't know if that helps. Okay, thank you for that. I think we, we just need not to lose sight of the fact that for quite a lot of disabled people, the car is still the only option to get where they need to go and to do what they need to do. And you know, that was one of our starting points this evening was that in some areas, in some ways, uh, we're excluding those people from their own neighborhoods by the low traffic uh, infrastructure and things of, of that kind. I wanted to turn uh, to some interesting questions that are coming up um, about a lot of disabled people and older people indeed um, have never used public transport. And one of the difficulties for them giving up driving is they don't know how to use the alternative. Uh, for, for, for Pedro's benefit, one of the, the things we quote often is that Margaret Thatcher, as our Prime Minister, said that if you were still on the bus by the time you were 40, you had failed in life. So we have a whole generation for whom being on the bus is a sign of, of absolute failure. Um, and as a result, we have lots of people now in their 80s and 90s who have no idea how a bus timetable works, uh, how to pay the money, where to go or anything else. So uh, Carol Thomas, another friend and colleague, has said uh, travel training for people who haven't used public transport can be useful alongside uh, that public transport routes need to have stops, more often stops, um, that are an accessible distance to destinations as well as accessible vehicles, um, a transformation of public transport to really serve people. And I think in, in this country, we put a lot of emphasis on making the vehicles accessible still a way to go, but they're, they're not bad. But it's still in a lot of places, a very long walk to a bus stop or in a rural area, it's, it's a long walk on a busy road with overhanging undergrowth and no phone signal and so on and so on. Um, somebody on the basis of that asks whether the panel agree that the lack of uh, formal training, experience, appreciation in undertaking a quality impact assessment is a significant obstacle to good design and whether we should have more emphasis on developing training. Uh, Derek Coffey asks whether the panel could design a syllabus, just get on with it please, uh, to incorporate all the principles that if followed would lead to a better understanding of how to create a truly sustainable and inclusive community and to understand the mechanisms whereby that could be realized. I think 
um, and, and, and shouldn't be facetious. And I think there's a very good point underneath that, that we still have a lot of transport professionals who don't understand these issues and don't know what to do about them if they do understand them. So would anyone like to pick up on the the issue of, of I mean, we've got two different sorts of, of training there. We've got issues of bus travel, but also of training professionals so that we're not designing systems that people can't use. Would like to kick in, Jim, you've got your hand up. Well, with regards to the travel training, which I just alluded to a few minutes ago, I say that in Hampshire, after a couple of high profile and very serious uh, traffic collisions, uh, Hampshire Police set up the Older Drivers Forum, which uh, helped support people, particularly, as Anne said, a generation who, you know, passed their driving test in the 60s and, and never taken the bus. And uh, yeah, uh, as one of the last resorts, it does include travel training and giving people information about what to do when that time comes when you do lose your license. As far as training the actual transport planners is concerned, well, this is part of what we're doing this evening, part of what we're doing with this whole series of events with the Transport Planning Society, also CILT, do a lot of work through their training arm, which is called PTRC. Uh, they, they do a lot of work training. I know that uh, people like the Access Association and Centre for Accessible Environments and the National Register of Access Consultants also do lots of training, some free, but others paid for, but at fairly bargain rates, most of them. And I'm also going to try and be positive here i find that a lot of our younger transport planners coming through the system do get it a lot more it's people my age and older who seem to have a lot of trouble grasping the issues i find that a lot of the younger people are have a really good uh I'll give Joanna some credit for this, but uh, when we ran the Transport Planning Society's bursary competition last year, in preparation for this year's transport planning campaign, we made the topic a transport system that is accessible for everyone. How do we make this happen? We have was it 21 or 23 proposals, of which we chose six, which in any previous year, all of those could have won the competition outright and in the end we did give it to somebody who will be giving a presentation on transport planning day which is 15th of november i think but uh, her paper her research was on uh, really is there a bias amongst transport people working in the transport planning industry and if so what do we do about it you know i'll just given the plug there about something else that I was going to talk about later. But I, I just wanted to make the point that a lot of the younger people coming through are really good. We've also got these events, which are good. Our, the previous event, which was chaired by Mark Frost, was a very, for the Transport Planning Society, was a very good event on preparing best practice and in preparing equality impact assessments. And uh, Yes, I knew that they'd come up today, but uh, yeah, the quality of those do vary greatly and quite often they're not prepared when they should have been prepared. So uh, yeah, we, you know, this is what we're all about, actually getting that information out there, training people, you know, sometimes formally, sometimes less so, sometimes by mentoring, sometimes by just gentle chivying, other times by uh, jumping up and down and shouting, you've got it wrong. You know that that's what that's what we're here today to do, to to try and get the points across, get it uppermost in people's heads. We've done it with sustainability. Now we're doing it, try, doing it with equality, diversity, and inclusion. Thanks, Sam. Back to you. Thank you. I was, I'll go to Susan in just a moment, but I just wanted to say that, to my mind, it's it's extraordinary that you can still, certainly in in the UK qualify as a mechanical engineer, an architect, a civil engineer, any kind of transport professional, 
without ever having studied or passed any kind of exam in the subject of accessibility. There's lots of stuff around, but it's, it's optional modules. Um, and I think I'm heartened by what Jim says about young people coming through, but I think we run a risk of perpetuating uh, the problems of previous generations if we allow people to go out there and, and make uh, decisions. And you see it every day on LinkedIn and elsewhere. There was a dreadful example today of a, a staircase and ramp combined. I'm feeling it's rather like the Parliament building in Brussels, um, which is a, a marvel of, of white concrete um, and absolutely lethal. And it was being massively admired for its beauty and aesthetics. Um, and that somehow you'd managed to combine a staircase and a ramp, but probably by uh, potentially killing a lot of people. So, you know, why are we not insisting that accessibility is, is part of the basic training? Anyway, get off my soapbox, Susan. You're on mute, Susan? Yeah, yeah sorry, the Thank mute you. button was, was being sticky. Um, I think for me, the most important thing is, is the awareness that we haven't got all the answers in terms of the transport planning profession, and we never will. Um, you know, I think when we are designing our streets, designing our places, we have to try and accommodate so many different diverse viewpoints and perspectives, and it's almost dangerous to think we understand them because we never fully do. And so for me, that emphasises the importance of listening to diverse voices. And I think there can be a danger. And, and, and we've seen this in terms of disabled people over the years, where for a long time, you know, the focus was on having step-free access. And, and, and if step-free access was achieved, then tick the box and, and, and that's done. And yes, that is important, but that is not the whole story. So for me, um, training is good but the most important thing is is awareness of, of our own limitations if you like and the fact that we do need to try and engage as many different diverse voices from the youngest to the oldest all the way through people with you know from different backgrounds from different perspectives be aware of some of the, the cultural differences as well rather than you know thinking that all people from a certain perspective think this you know I think there can be a danger in thinking we we understand it from someone else else's perspective we know we all have a tendency to design in our own image because that is what we understand that's what familiar is is, is familiar to us and it's really how we design outside of our own experience and we need to be as broad as possible in that way so training is good but i think even training can only go so far because there are so such a variety of different ways that people experience the built environment so i think it is it is that engagement and it is listening to those diverse voices those unheard voices those hard to reach voices that's for me is the way forward thank you pedro yeah i uh for for many for many years i did uh i did the uh, Thousand, over a thousand, thousand five hundred hours of training for professional architects, landscape architects, engineers, planners, etc. And I've, uh, I've heard, I, I never found anybody that would actually refuse the the principles and the the, the needs for accessibility and usability and safety. Um, and I did create a, a purposely. I created an environment where people would be. You know, to, to to squeeze out the prejudice that people could have about it. So, um, and I made sure everybody uh, talked. So, I mean, obviously, maybe some somebody went through my training that didn't really believe it. But uh, it was uh, what what I find um, the biggest. I mean, maybe the biggest insight for me came from talking to a to a colleague at the city, a civil engineer who came to me. You know, to get to say, you know, I, I want to do this project with a cross with accessible crosswalks. That was a long time ago. And I said, oh, engineer, good thing that you came and you asked and that you want to make them accessible. You know, accessibility is very important, universal design, inclusive design, safety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all, you know, I, I, I did the whole gospel. And he said, yeah, fine, I'm okay with it. I just know, I just want to know what is the right way to do it, you know, technically, just give me guidance. And it really occurred to me that um, there was no guidance. I mean, so there was the zero step level, but then the law said tactile paving, but there was no guidance for tactile paving. So what we did, and so there's this idea that, um, uh, you know, for, for professionals to be trained, you know, you give them training and you give them a manual and that's it. 
And actually, there's lots of other things that they need. I mean, they need technical support. When they're designing, all these situations come, came up, come up. And they're, they're, they're new and they're specific and there's no manual that says anything about it. There's no guidelines about it. So they need technical support, sometimes through consulting, uh, sometimes through just a hotline that they could call. I think that, for example, what they did in the United States when they implemented the Americans with Disabilities Act is that they created across the whole territory uh, technical support centers that people could call, uh, not email because they didn't have email at the time. Also, they need uh, peer support, opportunities for peer support to discuss and learn from their colleagues. They need opportunities to check out things that work uh, from others. They need protocols, guidance, uh, internal protocols and guidance, uh, and some learning mechanisms, you know, protocols that will ensure that the organization learns because the professional learn with the organization and the organization learns with the professionals. And um, I mean, I think that obviously I agree with Anne. I think it's a really a pity that uh, not, you know, that's a weak word, that's a euphemism, that uh, accessibility and universal design are still not mandatory uh, elements in architectural and engineering uh, courses or transport planning for in planning, urban planning for that matter. But we also have to find practical solutions for the professionals that are already out there, uh, my age, older, younger, um, and it has to be kind of a, a, a constellation of solutions. Uh, just just doesn't work with just training or a new flashy manual. Thank you, Joe. Joe, sorry, my picture jumped and then I couldn't unmute myself. It wasn't very helpful, was it? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that. I think that the points that you've um, made about training are really important, but also that kind of um, how we encourage more diverse people to um, from more diverse backgrounds and situations to come into the industry. Um, you know, my experience is that it's still this. It's still not very diverse in at the management level of, of transport planning and and uh, built environment work. And we need to make sure that we're encouraging people to come through. But we also need to be willing as managers and leaders in that field to um, be challenged, to be asked difficult questions, and to. Um, make sure that people are feel like they're in a safe place to ask those questions and challenge us because this isn't going to be a problem a problem or challenge or anything like that that's solved overnight there's there's a journey to go on with all of these things isn't there there's a journey in terms of professionals and then there's also the kind of political elements that's linked to the work that we want to do so I think I hope I think I'm, I'm in a room where people are broadly agree that we can do better and we want to build a better environment for everybody that is sustainable and more accessible it's just how we do that and how we make sure that we are communicating the right things and that we are showing everybody the progress that we're making and we're not being foxed by some of those difficult things so that we're up for the challenge to do this because because we can do so much better than this. Um, I also just wanted to pick up on this the, the, the discussion that was going on around um, public transport. I personally I think that we've made getting public transport way too difficult. There's a whole new language in terms of getting public transport. And this, um, I've always thought this, but it came to light to me the other day when I, when I got a bus for the first time somewhere for ages. And I thought, do you know what? I don't know how to pay anymore. Do I, can I still use my ticket that's a ticketed yeah. card? Where do I top it up? Do I pay on the bus is it contactless do I have to check off check on I don't know anymore will it tell me where my stop is it's just been made ridiculously complicated hasn't it so if you don't if you've got out of the way of using it or if you want to make a change we've put all these barriers in the way and you don't need to be able to do certain things and you need to be able to trust the driver or whoever's there to be able to stop in the right place to be and there's just too many mistakes that you can make so then it becomes the easiest thing not to use it and the danger of that is that people just get stuck in their homes and there's an issue over um, making sure that things are accessible to people. Um, my parents are quite elderly now. They've got free bus passes, but bus stops have been moved and are very difficult to get to. And that means that accessing medical appointments and other things are just made way more complicated than they need to. Um, so just a small example, they went to, um, mum went for a routine um, appointment the other day. There was a bus diversion um, the bus didn't turn up where they thought it was going to turn up. So that was a wasted afternoon of two hours. My dad's in his 80s. He doesn't need that. And he can't stand for very long. And the response that was received from the bus company, and I'm not out to kind of 
um, criticise bus companies, but there is some work they need to do on this, was, oh, it was all on our social media. My mum and dad haven't got smartphones, so how were they supposed to know? And then it just becomes frustrating and they just think it's just not worth the effort and they're just not going to do it. And so there's, there's a lot of stuff to unpick here. But I think we can all do better. And I think we've, we've got to face up to these difficult things and, and make sure we are doing better for everybody. Thank you. I think you've touched on a very important point there on, on technology um, and high tech. I mean, a very high proportion of actually even people over 50, never mind over 80, don't have smartphones, don't have access to the Internet. And yet increasingly uh, we're meant to buy our tickets online. If you try and get one at a, a station, for example, it's a touch screen, which is impossible for an awful lot of people. Um, it gets harder and harder to, to find out without using social media or without being on the, that sort of process. And I think you're absolutely right. I think we're at risk of alienating a whole generation um, simply because they, they don't have the technology, they don't understand the technology. And I think what we need to remember is that every generation will at some point be the same because we will all suddenly realize we don't understand the latest thing um, and we get left behind. So there's a tendency to think, oh, well, it's the current generation of old people. Once they're gone, it'll all be great. But it won't because each of us, as we get to that age, will start to fall behind the technology and need help and need human interface. And at the moment, I mean, what, what most people say is, above everything else, they want the presence of uniformed staff if they're using public transport. It doesn't matter that there's a board there saying next train five minutes. They need to ask somebody when is the next train. And, you know, I think, I think we, we neglect that at our peril, uh, not just now, but in, in, in future generations. I'm sorry, we've kind of strayed away a bit from some of our original uh, topics, but this has been a, a fascinating discussion. But I wanted to bring us right back, if I may, to the, uh, the dreaded subject of electric scooters. What puzzles me is that you see newspaper headlines all over Europe about people being killed and injured um, by reckless driving, uh, people who shouldn't be driving them, driving them, people leaving them on the pavement and tripped over. So, and yet every city is still desperate to introduce uh, e-scooters um, for more people to be knocked over, killed, injured. I know there's been at least one fatality of a, an older lady in Madrid and a lot of other um, injuries and people who've, who've lost the confidence to go out because they're so frightened of them. They're silent, they're fast, they're on the pavement, even though they shouldn't be. Um, have we gone mad? I think is my question. We're doing, we're promoting politically, every city must have its e-scooters, and yet I'm struggling to see the benefit of them. Um, they just seem to me to be, to be making the cities less attractive, less safe uh, for an awful lot of people. Uh, am I completely off the wall? Who'd like to say anything on that? Go on, Pedro, tell me what you think. You read my mind. I was <laughs> I was reaching for the for the button. Uh -huh. well, um, I have a problem with well three comments. Number one, um, people are riding e-scooters on the sidewalks. Well, no, let me start by this. I, as I've mentioned, I worked for over a decade on accessibility and changing the practices of a city and trying to get clutter out of the sidewalks, etc., etc., etc. Then in 2017 or 18, the e-scooters arrived and basically destroyed almost a decade of work uh, because they took completely overrun the, the sidewalks of, of Lisbon and they were parked everywhere, as you still see them parked everywhere in many cities around Europe. So that's definitely a problem. It's an accessibility problem. It's a safety problem. It, it's, it's unacceptable. That said, I think uh, we must understand the following. Number one, people are riding e-scooters on the sidewalks because they are afraid of riding them on the carriageway. And people are parking e-scooters everywhere chaotically on the sidewalks. And I'm not, for, I'm not, let's say, finding excuses for them. But I would just point out that there, there's a monopoly of the private car on parking on the right of way. So when we say they shouldn't be parked there, but then where should they be parked? The fact is that there isn't alternative. Again, that is not an excuse. 
is just to understand this from a systemic point of view. So the same that goes for e-scooters goes for bikes. Um, and so there is clearly um, the, the roadway is monopolized by motorized vehicles. And that's a huge problem because that's usually around 70, 80% of the width of the right of way. Uh, so we have the same thing, the same we have e-scooters, we will soon be having uh, robots doing deliveries on the sidewalks. They're doing it already in some cities. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I like it. It's, it's stuff that's going to happen. You have people, you have kids parking their, their, their Vespas on the sidewalk in front of McDonald's because they're going to do instant deliveries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the big, the, the origin of the big problem I think here is that there's a monopoly on the right of way by motorized vehicles. And that makes everything else harder. The second point is that we can discuss, um, the, obviously we can discuss and we should discuss the safety issues raised by uh, e-scooters riding on sidewalks and parking on sidewalks are two different issues. And there has been uh, deaths. I know of a death in Paris. Uh, I know there was one in Spain. Um, and obviously even, but. I think that uh, respectively, I mean, regardless of the deaths, I think it's the fear and the discomfort that this creates that is in itself already a problem. But um, again, focusing just on it without at the same time always talking about the source of the problem. Uh, it's a little bit like discussing the crumb, trying to fight for the crumbs on the table after somebody else has, has, has eaten the whole bread. And uh, again, the big problem is that the monopoly, monopoly over the public right of way. Um, on, the on the discussion of uh, e-scooters, um, I see that at the European level, most of the discussion has gone towards data sharing because people from the transport sector, of course, you know, the, the, the getting data on traffic was always like so difficult that now that you suddenly have a transport mode that has generates real-time traffic data is like the holy grail. And so unfortunately, that's where most of the discussion has been about give us your data, what do you want our data for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And very little by comparison regarding the governance of these companies and specifically to understand um, that um, how they can serve the public good because obviously they can provide a critical mass of, uh, we've been dreaming for years, uh, sustainable mobility advocates have been dreaming for years of a critical mass of people cycling. Well, there's a critical mass, all right? They're just not cycling, they're using e-scooters. And the point is that if we don't understand this, we don't strive to govern uh, this initiative in a productive manner, then this is what we get, you know, scooters all over the place, hitting people and making them close, stay at home because they're afraid to use the sidewalk. Okay, we've had an interesting comment come in that Sofia in Bulgaria is an excellent example of why they've allocated car parking spaces for e-scooters, and they see a much lower problem with e-scooters on the pavement. I think somebody else mentioned that earlier, so that's that's an interesting um, one, and it's you know it, it it's true. I think that the, they've been introduced without any thought about how they're going to be used and without any proper monitoring or regulation or enforcement in many cases. Um, let me. We're, we're running out of, of time shortly. I wanted to bring us back to cyclists and pedestrians, which I think is one of the, the, the key issues. There's enormous emphasis on, on promoting cycling for all the reasons we know about. And yet in many cases, there are conflicts, actual or perceived, between cyclists and pedestrians. And what do we do about it? We've had the, the we've discussed the, the floating bus stop. Um, John Carr's come up with the suggestion that you put bike lanes on the crown of the road, so you don't have them um, interfering with pedestrian access. I see other problems with that. There's a, there's an issue. Somebody's mentioned the term quiet enjoyment, and I think that's that's quite an important one for an awful lot of pedestrians, and particularly older or disabled pedestrians. The pleasure um, of being out, being able to go and do your shopping locally or whatever it is you want to do, has been lost because of the fear of cyclists on the pavement, of aggressive cycling, of e-scooters being aggressive. How do we get that balance better? 
I mean, my personal view is that cyclists can always get off and walk. Pedestrians have no choice, particularly disabled pedestrians. But what else can we do? How can we, how can we end this growing conflict that exists in so many cities? Susan, do you want to kick off on that? Yeah, I'm happy to kick off on that. I think, I mean, I think the first thing is for too long, cycling has been seen as a as a sport. It's been some, seen as something sort of fast paced and the emphasis has been on, on speed. Um, and for me, in terms of how we get over any conflict between cycling and walking, perceived or actual, is, is largely a measure of space. Um, and I said, as I see this very clearly in the low traffic neighbourhoods where the amount of traffic has gone down. So people actually feel safe to cycle in, in the roadway and to walk in the roadway, to wheel, to use mobility scooters. So people have really shifted from trying to negotiate the difficult, crowded footways to actually just using the whole of the street and being being and feeling safe to do so. So shared use, I think DFT now has come down strongly against shared use for the majority of locations. Obviously, there's a difference if you're a three-year-old on a cycle and you're with someone who's walking or something. So I think, you know, it, we need to need to look at it in that broad way as well. But I think it's it's about creating that space. And that almost goes back to the parking question earlier. The consultation and, and decision making in the UK tends to respond, I think, far more to people objecting than people supporting. And if we could show support, not for getting rid of all parking on our streets, because some people will always need it, but for reducing the amount of parking and showing what positive use could be made of that space instead. And that would include wider footways, that would include either protected cycleway or reducing the amount of vehicles on that street so cyclists, pe people feel safe cycling in the carriageway. For me, that's the way of, it's because it, it's it's a shortage of space, it's limitation of space. And the one way that we can find space is by reducing the presence of parked vehicles on, on the street. I said, not for everybody, but every day I pass vehicles that never move. I mean, they've got plants growing out of them sort of thing. You know, these vehicles have been there for months or sometimes years and people are just using the streets as, as storage for them. But actually much better use could be made. And I think we need to start lobbying our council members because parking is very local politics and actually demanding that better use can be made of the streets more equitable use can be made of street space so that there is more space for everybody not so that the majority of space is taken up by a minority of users thank you joanna did you want to come in yeah i think i think i i, mean, I, I agree with everything Susan said, it's um, a lot of this is about space, isn't it? And sharing the space. And it feels like, um, I mean, I, I do um, ride my bike and I do walk. I wouldn't, cons I'd never call myself a cyclist. I'm just somebody who likes riding their bike. And I, I'm not a um, sport kind of um, person. I just like sometimes for longer journeys, it's easier to ride your bike than it is to walk. But um, I think that um, the problem's almost been pushed down the line, hasn't it? Cycl uh, people who ride bikes don't feel safe riding on the carriageway. So then they ride on the pavement and then that, um, uh, produces all sorts of problems for people trying to use the pavement so it is about using the space um, mm. in my job I deal with um, complaints from both sides like every day <laughs> just get complaint you know complaints about different users every day and it's um it's some are quite aggressive about other um, road users you know other pavement users and I don't think this is helped by the media I think that it's almost set up this kind of conflict thing it, you, you always dread as a transport planner um, any phone-ins on radio to certain programs about cycling and, and pedestrians and road space because you just know that it's going to create all sorts of problems and and uh, but we should be having that discussion shouldn't we about what the kind of areas that we want to live in and how we make it as accessible for everybody as possible and I feel a bit kind of um, like I'm being patronised by saying well you just need to be nice to each other and talk to each other and ring your bell and just be sensible about the speed you're going because other people are trying to use it as well but it is it is that basic isn't it is about making sure that everybody feels safe to be able to go about the, their business on the mode of transport that's suitable for them and that they're able to do that and access the things that they need to do so it is that simple but it's going to require us all taking responsibility for it and by that, I mean professionals and working with the public and working with the politicians 
and going on this literal journey of how we turn around the way that we do things. Um, so I just, I suppose, really, I'm as frustrated as a pedestrian, frustrated as a cyclist, <laughs> frustrated as a non-driver. And um, yeah, there's some big things for us to tackle. And I, I think that the piece that stuck with me is what Susan was saying earlier about how we haven't got all the answers, but we need to work together. To, to make this more accessible to, to more people. So there is a lot of work to do and we shouldn't shy away from that. Yeah, absolutely. I should just apologise. I've been taken to task by somebody who said that not all cyclists can get off and walk. Of course, there are people, disabled people using adapted bikes. So I apologise for that. But I think the majority of my point probably is, is reasonably valid. We're, we're fast running out of time. Um, I, I have one point I want to come back to, but I was going to ask each of our three panellists if they had any concluding and brief pearls of wisdom that they haven't yet been able to share. Pedro? Yeah, well, no pearls of wisdom here, just to, to add a comment on the um, <clears throat> on, on, on the discussion of, of, of bike lanes. I mean, again, as I've mentioned before, I think it's essential that we need to segregate well where it is indispensable to segregate, and we need to integrate well where it is feasible to integrate and to integrate we the, the bike lanes with the bike traffic with the motorized traffic we have to drastically reduce speed we have to ensure through traffic calming measures and traffic management that both the volumes and the speeds are reduced instead of just you know doing the easy way which is just get there and paint something and then deal with the backlash from people who want to uh, who are who complain about narrow uh, traffic lanes um, so, and I think that we, we look, when we look at uh, networks, um, I, I see a lot of um, cross sections of, you know, how is going to be the new roadway once we put in the bike lane. I see a lot of cross sections. Uh, I see very few uh, intersections. And that I think is basically one of the weakest spots of most of the cycling design. Intersections between bike traffic, the, the bike infrastructure, where we do want segregated bike lanes, intersection between the, the, cycle, the, the bike lane and the pedestrian crosswalks and the, the motorized traffic in the intersections and the bus stops, because this is all intersections of, of, of networks. And um, definitely the fact that we want to pursue bike lanes in places where we should be instead pursuing integration of bike traffic and motorized traffic just aggravates and generates lots of problems. Um, I would say finally, as a pearl of wisdom, if I may, I, will, I would quote uh, Seneca, the Roman thinker who said, you know, um, if you don't know your port of destination, uh, no wind is favorable. And I think that uh, often a big problem is that um, when we discuss transport planning and the shift to sustainable mobility, uh, we fail to really spend enough time discussing the why, the purpose, uh, because if we did spend enough time, not necessarily a lot of time, but enough time, we would see, we would base all our planning and design work on um, making people happy, safe, uh, and included. Uh, and we usually jump to conclusions, jump to solutions, jump to measures, instead of spending enough time thinking about the why. Thank you, I absolutely agree with that. And I think that brings us back to a point we, we started with from uh, Bridget Burdett in, in New Zealand, that we, until we are measuring and understanding the impact of what we're doing, we're not going to understand how to put it right. And I think, you know, there are lots of things we know how to measure, but measuring displacement, measuring lost mobility is not something that we're very good at. Uh, a last very brief, because I know Jim wants to come back at the end, but first Susan and then Joe, any uh, parting words? Thank you. I think I would go back to what I said at the beginning about every transport policy choice is an equity decision. Um, it's also a health decision. It's an environmental decision. It's a sustainable decision. And we need to see transport in terms of those those outcomes that Pedro was just talking about. Um, I think it would help if we talked about transport in that way. I'm, I'm always mindful of the, the comment that the best way to talk about transport is not to talk about transport. You talk about the outcomes and you talk about the, what it can achieve. So I agree that's the way it should be measured. And I said we need to have more awareness of the interconnecting policy areas. Um, I know that discussion has been going on for a long time, but I said you, you can't, going back to the original point, 
for me, you cannot separate sustainability and inclusion. They are bound up together. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Joe, any final brief thoughts? Um, just that it's been a fantastic um, discussion this evening. I've really enjoyed being part of it. Um, I was in a meeting earlier with other um, Transport Planning Society directors and Jim was there and I was um, uh, raising with them the issue that we, we as a society, Transport Planning Society, don't want this just to be, oh, back in 2001, we discussed equality, diversity and inclusion and then we moved on and discussed something else next year. Right. We are keen to hear from members and, and other interested um, people about how we can make some real difference within the society to the profession so please get in touch with us please join in with the other transport planning day um, events and there's a great body of work on the um, transport planning society website so all of those bursary entries from last year that jim mentioned earlier are all up there so have a look at those but there's also been some fantastic blogs um, from all sorts of um, different people uh, working in the profession looking at different aspects of this topic and it's taken us in many many directions um, there's a lot of work to do don't be disheartened. There's um there's a lot of us working on this and we can work together. So get in touch, link up with each other and um, let's get things changed. Thank you for that. And I think before I hand back to, to Jim, I think my, my message would very much be the same, that this is not the end of the conversation. And by definition, the people who've given up their evening to be part of this debate already care about what we're talking about. And there's a whole world out there of people who, who don't understand these issues they don't appreciate the importance of it so I think we've got a long way to go but it's been an immensely interesting conversation and um, with my CILT hat on if I can say how grateful we are to TPS for uh, organizing hosting this event um, which I think has, has stimulated something that we'll need to continue but let me give the final word Jim you have two and a half minutes otherwise I'll cut you off over to you <laughs> oh thanks and uh... I'd like to wrap up just by thanking our panel, Susan, Joanna and Pedro for taking part. And a big thank you also to Anne for co-chairing and for coming up with this topic in the first place. And I genuinely love to say thank you to everybody who's all, all of you out there in the ether who asked questions and to all the delegates for attending. And also say thanks to Brogan and the team at PTRC for organising this event. Uh, I'd also, while I'm here, like to say a big shout out to current Transport Planning Society Chair Mark Frost and his predecessor, Stephen, Benef Stephen Bennett. And it was Stephen, along with Joe, who co-opted me onto the Transport Planning Society board with a specific aim of pushing access and inclusion up the agenda in transport planning. So, you know, uh, the TPS, an organisation with its nearly 1,500 members, all professionals working in the industry, the, you know, we are taking it seriously. And so is the CILT, which is one of the uh, uh, supporting organisations of Transport Planning uh, Society. And although we've touched on it already, I'd like to say that this evening's event is part of the wider Transport Planning Day campaign, whose theme is on making our transport system accessible to all. The Transport Planning Day itself will be on the 15th of November, and uh, speakers include Emma Ward, the Director General for Roads, Places and Environment at the Department of Transport, and Lord David Blunkett, the former Home Secretary. Also on that bill will be Victoria Heald, who is the winner of the 2021 uh, bursary competition, which we mentioned earlier. And as Joe has already said, check out the Transport Planning Society website for blogs and other news and events on this topic. And also in November, December, we'll be having parliamentary receptions, unfortunately, online viewing only. Uh, and that will be on hate crime in public spaces and left behind neighbourhoods. And just before I go, I'll say that there's a couple of events coming up which you may be interested in. Uh, for any CILT members, uh, we have our Access and Inclusion Forum next meeting in the morning of the 27th of October. And for anybody who wants to take part, the Access Association, who are always putting on really good CPD at 
you know, even to non-members, it's at a minimal cost. And uh, they will be running a seminar on the afternoon of the 9th of November, focusing on neurodiversity. Uh, when we put together the, uh, the film of this on YouTube, and uh, we'll also try and uh, harvest any links, including links to these future events. But apart from that, I'd just like to say thank you all very much for coming and for staying the course. And uh, good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.